Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Summer flowers give a pop of color to the garden. Today we are planting scavola, pentas, and vinca. Also, the corn is growing. We'll talk about what to do to maximize your harvest. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Joellen Diamond. Joellen is the Director of Landscape at the University of Memphis, and Mr. D will be joining me later. All right, Joellen, this is one of my favorite things to do right here. Yeah. So what, what are we going to do today? Well, the landscaper changed out the flowers, and then they did something that we don't really recommend, and they uh -huh. cut the daffodils back. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, now, that. what we like to do is leave the foliage and let it die down naturally, because okay. that's how it's going to produce energy to have blooms for next year. Okay. Now, that's not to say that there's not going to be some blooms, but it may not be as many as there would normally have been if the foliage had been left. Okay. And, you know, I know it gets gangly and unsightly, and if you want to, you can always tie them in a knot so that they're lower to the ground, and they'll still use the chlorophyll that they produce to, okay. for the blooms for next year. Yeah, because we want that energy to go back down into the bulb. Yes. Right? Okay. Exactly. All right. And today we're going to plant three plants, uh, a blue scavola, yeah. a red pentas, okay. and a white with a red center vinca. Okay, good deal. Have we planted any of those in this area before? We actually have planted vinca before. And you know, you rotate your crops for tomatoes and other vegetables. You have to do the same thing for your annuals also. Okay. There are several of them, like the vinca, that you can only plant once every three, two, three years okay. in a rotation. You can't plant them all in the same plant in this in every year in the same place. Okay. You have to rotate the crops of the annuals just like you do vegetables. How about that? Okay. All right, Joellen. Well, let's get started. Yes. Okay. First thing we're going to do is we're going to put down some slow-release ah. fertilizer uh, just to give them a little bit okay. of energy for the start of the season. Right, just a little boost there. And just a little bit of a little bit of a fertilizer here. Okay. Again, this is our slow release. Slow release. Not too much. All right. First thing we'll plant is this Beautiful. blue scavola. Now, the scavola comes in pink and white also, but the blue is the original one. It's a little bit more vigorous than the others. Okay. These are good for container plants. Um, they'll spill over the side. They use them for hanging baskets, but they also can be planted in the ground and they can run around the ground. I'm excited about those. Never done that before. Yeah, we've never yeah. planted these before. Yeah, never done those before. Yeah, we're going to plant these we're going to plant these first because they are the largest of yeah. all that we're planting. And we may not need all that we've gotten here. Okay. Because they will spread out through the bed. Yeah, those are going to be nice. And will these bloom all summer? Yes, these will bloom all summer. Okay. These will, these will, will stay, the, the, some of the runners will get longer. And you can always trim these during the season if you, if they, you think that they are getting too big. Right. But uh, the idea is these will run along and be underneath the other plants that we're planting. Nice. Okay. Right, so you want us to start? We can, we can go ahead and plant these okay. first. Of course, you're going to knock them. They, you can see roots at the bottom coming yeah, out. Yeah, I see that. Nice root system, too. Mm -hmm. you, you pop it out of the plant very gently and see how root bound it is at the yeah. bottom. Uh, very nice and healthy roots. Yeah. But since they're circling the pot, we might to just uh, pull them apart a little bit in a few places just to stop that circling pattern. All right, we just tickle the roots a little bit, right? And move the mulch just out of the way and dig a hole right. and plant the plant. Level with the soil level that's in here. Don't bury it in the ground. Okay. And Joel and I do see earthworms. Yay, good organic mirror in this yeah. bed.
And if we have some pieces that are broken off, we can just go ahead and just, can people just pinch those off? Yes, you can. Just fine? In okay. fact, some people might actually trim all this back so that it's, it's it, all these long uh, stems are gone. Okay. To let it start all over again. Okay. So that is an option. Is right. an option. Good. We'll plant the pentas next. Good. Beautiful red color. And we can expect those blooms all summer as well? Yes. Okay. And these can get a little bit tall. Oh, okay. Um, I'd say 12 to wow. possibly even 18 inches, um, but 12 to 15 is normal. I like to lay them out first before I plant them because I like to see what it looks like once they're planted. And since we know these get a little bit bigger, uh, we space them out accordingly okay. so that they don't crowd each other because that's when you get disease problems. Yes. And so there's always a method to the way you set these out, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like to, I like mixed color beds and I like to mix up the colors in yeah. the bed. More kind of somewhat even like a patchwork. All right. Got them all in. Okay. Now that these are all pl in place, we can plant them. All right. This is going to be nice. These don't seem to be as root bound and I don't feel the need to try to move them too much out of the way. We'll have to look at each one. Okay. Some of them are okay, some of them need a little bit of separation. Again, we don't want to bury them, so we're gonna try to stick with the same level of soil that it was grown in. And there's okay. an earthworm. Goody, goody. Yay. So our garden friend. That last one for you there. <laughs> I'm right yeah. here. Yeah. Oh, soil is good too. Well, it's really good. Well, it's nice. Yeah, it's good. Now we got blue and red. Now for the white vinca. All right. Now we have the white vinca in here and it's ready to plant. Okay. So the same principles. Same apply. principles. And vinca sometimes is not real well rooted and so you got to be careful uh, handling some of them sometimes. Ah. Keeping them together, keep the roots, roots as uh, together as possible when you're planting. and don't plant them too deep. Are there any disease issue or pest issues we need to be concerned about? Um, the only disease issues are with the vinca. With the vinca? And that usually occurs when there's, they're being um, planted every year after year. Okay. That's why you have to make that be at least two, three, sometimes even four years between vinca plantings in okay. a bed. Just like you would tomatoes. Okay. So again, that rotation that you were talking about. Yes. Not just for your vegetable garden, Not right? Not just for your vegetable garden, you're for your annuals also. All right. And so now we have an, a theme of red, white, and blue for the summer. For the summer. I can't wait to see what it looks like once everything grows up and fills in, right? Yes, We've got, I think it's gonna look good. This is always fun, Joel, and thank you. It is. I appreciate that. You're welcome. is showing signs of iron chlorosis. It's very prevalent on the leaves. You can tell it has iron chlorosis because it has these dark green veins and the outside is more of a chartreuse kind of yellowing color. So it needs some iron and some fertilizer and then that will go away and this tree will green up. And of course you also see some lichens on here and there's nothing wrong with that, they're fine. Hi, Mr. D. Let's talk a little bit about corn. And the corn is really jumping out of the ground now. It's blowing and going now. 
kind of had a slow start this year. It was so cool and damp conditions early, and and we had a little trouble with it early, but it's 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 blowing and going now. It's doing pretty good. Uh, really doing good. Um, but if you, so so really, it's too late to start talking about planting corn. Yeah. Really, I mean, yeah. you can plant corn now, uh, and you could probably harvest it sweet corn, uh, but you're going to have a lot more insect problems and you'll have to really fight the European corn borer and, oh. and earworms and things a lot more now if you start with it this late. But, uh, you know, growing corn is, is pretty easy to do if you uh, soil test, you know, check your soil level, make sure your pH is up there where it ought to be, you know, six and a half. Uh, uh, with corn, it's not a legume, so it doesn't put nitrogen in the soil. Mm -hmm. so. You're going to need to side dress it, and you know some of our plot corn is only about this tall. And then within the next couple of weeks, we'll be going in there and hitting it with more nitrogen, additional nitrogen. But okay. you fertilize according to soil test before you plant, and then you side dress uh, with uh, in a home garden. It's about I think about a pint of ammonium nitrate or 3400 yeah. per hundred foot a row yeah. or something like that. Um, scout. Keep an eye out for insects. Uh, European corn borer and uh, the corn earworm are probably a couple of the worst insects right. that, that can create problems. What kind of damage do they do? Uh, the uh, European corn borer is the first one that you'll get, and they'll get into the uh, plant when it's small, and uh, they'll feed in the whorl of the, the leaf, uh, the whorl of the plant down in the very center of the plant. And if you can imagine, that new leaf is developing, and it's like a quarter of an inch yeah. long, and you've got a little caterpillar that's probably about an eighth of an inch long feeding through that tiny little leaf wow. and then the corn plant continues to grow and when the leaf becomes 36 inches long and, and four inches wide those little bitty holes are, are that like you know they're, they're okay. like a, you know a quarter of an inch in diameter they okay. look like real look, looks like you have a real big critter feeding on your leaves but it's old damage okay. and it really doesn't affect the plant. Uh, the corn earworm, of course, uh, that's later, that's when you have the, the, the ear being formed and the, and the corn earworm gets in and feeds on the kernels. And uh, so you really try to protect that ear, you know, when you're, you know, when it's silking. And from, from the time of silking until, until you harvest, almost, you pretty much have to mm. protect that. Unless your, your variety happens to be BT yeah. corn. If it's got the Bacillus thuringiensis gene in it, then when that critter, either either of those critters, the European okay. corn borer or the earworm feeds on them, they'll get a big stomach ache and die. You know, they, <laughs> that's really what not. you want. Yeah, that's what you. Yeah. And I, you know, I know there's some BT varieties out there. The the most popular varieties, uh, Silver Queen mm -hmm. is the white, sweet, really sweet, sweet corn, which is really good. And then Peaches and Cream is one that's kind of mixed between you know white and yellow, and it's really sweet also. It's a good variety. Harvesting co sweet corn is, is important. It's best to harvest it early in the morning and you realize that the sugars in the sweet corn, as soon as you harvest it, begins to turn to starch. So, so harvest it early in the morning and, you know, try to get it in a cooler or, so or something to, to slow down that, that uh, breakdown of, uh, uh, sugar to starch and, uh, and, uh, you know, harvest only what you need and, but harvest it right if you wait too long, too late and then the, the, the kernels will get real hard and mm -hmm. you know so, so it's just it's best in a home garden situation if you can kind of stagger your plantings okay you know plant you know uh, a row or two you know and then wait a couple of weeks plant another row or two that way you'll spread out your harvest a little bit it's a good idea so what about hills versus rows as far as planting your corn does it make a difference <laughs> you know uh i don't really think so i i know i've all, always planted corn in rows and you know you, you don't Get corn too thick. It's a big plant. It mm -hmm. takes a tremendous amount of nutrients from the from the uh, soil and takes a lot of water to produce corn. And so I, you know, eight inches apart is close enough for sweet corn. You can even stretch it out a little further than that. But but eight six to eight inches apart is good if you don't have a lot of space mm -hmm. in rows. And you know, there's no need to bed it up. They, but they will work in, in beds or uh, it's it's just not as uh, you need some room to grow corn, yeah. realizing you only get one ear, maybe two ears off each plant. So if you only have four or five corn stalks in a raised bed, you're not going to feed a very large family. Right. You know, you may have one meal, 
<laughs> just the one meal. <laughs> That's provided. Maybe. Yeah, a maybe, right? Corn at my I do. Corn. <laughs> and also, it's a good idea to plant enough corn for you and the raccoon because uh-huh. raccoons also okay. like sweet corn. And okay. if you only have four or five plants and they take three of them down, they've taken, Ain't you trouble. know, most of your crop. Oh, and man. if you've got a row up, you know, 25 feet long, you know, they take 10 feet of it out, you still have some sweet corn. So you got to share. How about that? Go share with raccoons. Most so, so what about watering? Because we know corn needs a lot of water. It needs a lot of water. It needs a lot of water. I would just, uh, you know, any week that you don't get a half inch of rain, I guess cool. kind of treat it like you do your yard. Yeah. You know, any, any week that you don't get a half inch of rain, give it a half inch. And then as the crop is maturing, uh, you know, you're going to up that a little bit. Drip is a really good way oh, to, okay. to, to water corn. Uh, if you, uh, you know, soaker hoses, if you had it in rows. Uh, to try to keep the water off the foliage just as yeah. you would your ornamental right. because sure. uh, there are diseases that will attack corn. There's several diseases that uh, will attack them, and you try to keep that foliage as dry as you can. Okay. You know? How is corn pollinated? How is corn pollinated? Yeah. Uh, the, to- the tassel that comes out the top of the plant releases pollen. Okay. Pollen will fall down to the uh, silks. Each silk. On, that comes out of the tip of an ear of corn, you know, the, the pollen will go into that. That silk is a hollow tube, oh. and that pollen will go down that hollow tube, and each sil- each kernel of corn has its own silk. And so if pollination occurs, you know, that, that that's how it happens. And, and, and it doesn't happen really well when temperatures are in the upper 90s oh, and 100, around 100 degrees, mm-hmm. and, and when it's that hot, it just doesn't occur. I don't know whether the pollen can't get through the silk. The silk, you know, draws up too small or what. But but when temperatures are really really hot, um, we have trouble with pollination. And so if you uh, if you've got a your corn in a bed and it's really hot, you may want to put a fan on it. You know, during pollination <laughs> and uh, try to air condition it or get out there and fan it. Yeah, and cool it down a little but, bit. Uh, but uh, in the field and 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 during the real hot dry conditions, we had a few years ago. It was not at all unusual for to have a cob with no kernels on it, uh-huh. and you don't get much money out of that, you know, when you're trying to sell corn for farmers. So um, they really, really, the farmers really get concerned about high temperatures when pollination is occurring. Well, and I haven't That's seen, I've seen, I haven't seen much corn, you know, silking and tasseling yet, okay. uh, tasseling, but uh, uh, it won't be long. They'll start doing that. Wow. So each and individual. It usually happens soup. during the hottest part of the year, too. So, yeah. you know. But corn likes hot weather. No. It likes hot weather for growing, but but not pollinating. Not really hot. I mean, but I mean, 85 mm. degrees, you know, it's fine for pollination. You know, typical average summer temperatures is okay for pollination. Okay. But the really, really hot, you know, temperatures like we had, you know, a few weeks ago, and, you know, yeah. it's, it's, uh, makes it tough. All right. Well, Mr. D, we definitely appreciate that. And, uh, Plant extra for the coons. Plant extra for the raccoons. That's for, <laughs> for sure. the raccoons. Right. Yeah. Thank you. When it is time to side dress your tomato plants, you want to use about a tablespoon of a nitrogen fertilizer. You want to do this probably monthly. The best thing to do is to get about a tablespoon or so of a nitrogen fertilizer. Now you don't, want to, you don't want this fertilizer to actually touch the stem of your tomato plants, okay? Just somewhere on the side like that would be good enough. And nitrogen is actually needed to make the plant grow and to make it green. As you can see here, it's already turning a faint green color. So again, this nitrogen is going to help it to turn a more darker green color. But be cautious, you don't want to use too much nitrogen fertilizer because you're going to get more foliage than fruit. After you finish spreading your fertilizer, don't forget to water it in. So again, be careful when you're spreading your nitrogen fertilizer. Do it monthly when you're side dressing, and you should be just fine. All right, Joellen, here's our Q&A segment. You All ready? Right. Yes. These are some great questions we Good have questions. here. Good questions. Yes. All right, let's get to our first viewer email. I have some yellow irises in my front flower bed. The flowers have long gone and have turned to seed pods. Can you tell me when to collect them and how and when to plant them? This is Carrie in Memphis, Tennessee. Yes. Right. So can we help her out with that? Yes, we can. Sure. Iris, the state of Tennessee's uh, flower. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, the seed head, you got to wait till they dry. 
and once they, they're dried, you can collect them, and you have to wait till a cooler weather starts in the mm -hmm. fall, and then plant them in the ground right. outside in the fall. Right, so plant those seeds uh, in the fall, sunny location, mm -hmm. well-drained soils. Yes. Right. And I think it'll be just fine. I think so too. Yeah, I think it'll be fine. I actually learned that from somebody from the Irish Society. How about that? So yes. I was listening that day. All right, so there you have it, Miss Carrie. All right, good luck with that. Should work, for, should work out for you good, okay? Here's our next fear email. I am growing peppers from seed and containers. Should I use a fertilizer or will good organic potting soil be enough? If I do use a fertilizer, what should I use? And this is Deanna in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So she wants to grow peppers from seed in a container. Yeah. That's good. That's very good. Yeah, I like that. So what would you recommend? Fertilizer or? She could do either one. Either one. Really. Okay. Um, a lot of potting mixes already have fertilizer mm -hmm. in them. Um, organic or non-organic potting mix all have, sometimes they have fertilizer mm -hmm. in them already. They will last up to, you know, three months, probably around here about a month or two. Right. Uh, but if she wants to supplemental, uh, add a little more organic matter to, to make it uh, more nutritious for them, but don't go too crazy with fertilizer yes. because you're going to get a whole bunch of green and exactly. you're not going to get the blooms and the, the uh, yeah, the nice fruit. peppers right. that you that want. You, yeah, yeah. You gotta. They gotta think they're starving a little bit, so you don't want to feed them too much anyway. Yeah. yeah so hold off the nitrogen fertilizer because yes. we don't want too much foliage. Right. Yeah. We want fruit. Right. Want, Concentrate want, on the fruit, which are the peppers. On the fruit. Oh uh, yeah, but I would go with uh, with organic material, compost. Yeah. Or you can go with the fertilizer. Yeah, whatever, right. Whichever she likes. Right. Yeah. So good luck with that. And yeah, I like the fact that she's starting them from seed. I do too. In a container. I think that's pretty good. All right, so thank you for that question. Here's our next viewer email. What are the names of these flowers? This is Richard. Ah, I think we've seen those, haven't we? Yeah, we actually have some out front. <laughs> yeah, we have some out front. <laughs> those are canna, the different kinds of cannas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I say just enjoy them. They have nice big leaves on them. Fairly, some of them are fairly large plants. Some of them can be smaller. It just depends on what variety it is. You could fertilize it in the spring, uh, but I wouldn't fertilize it too much. Again, you don't want them yeah. to grow crazy. With foliage, you want the blooms. Um, also, watch for leaf rollers yes. <laughs> and things that like to chew. There's a lot of caterpillars that yeah. like to chew and insects that like to chew on the leaves. And, you know, BTs, BT. Bacillus thuringiensis, is good to, for the leaf rollers or any kind of uh, uh, little bugs that you get on there the, from the caterpillars that like to chew on them. Yeah, yeah. and they're basically, yeah, caterpillars. They're yeah. kind of leaf roller. Leaf right, roller. so there you have it. Yeah, just use BT, dipel, javelin. That works. Uh -huh. uh, but that's the name. It's just yeah, canna, right? Yeah, and they are beautiful. Yeah, I definitely beautiful. like the ones we have out front. So thank you, Richard. We appreciate that. And beautiful pictures. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you much. Uh, here's our next viewer email. I have spots on the leaves of my reblooming daylilies. What is causing this? Jason in Rogersville, Tennessee. So what do we think that is? It's a fungus. It's a fungus. It's, okay. a, fungus. it's a fungus. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's hard to tell from the picture, but maybe if he turned over the leaves, mm -hmm. he might see spores on the okay. underside of the leaves because of uh, uh, leaf streak. Leaf streak. Yeah. I actually had that on my daylilies last year, uh, so very familiar with that. It is a fungus. Uh, a couple of things there. Practice good sanitation, right? Yes. When the so leaves die, when they make die. sure mm -hmm. you collect all of that. And of course, if, if, it, if it persists and he doesn't spray with fungicides, can't control it, I would take them out and put in some de resistant varieties. Because yes. there are or quite a bit varieties. of yeah. resistant varieties out there in the market that he could find. Right, so resistant varieties, practice against sanitation, right? Or, you know, you mentioned you could use fungicides, but understand you're gonna be doing that on a continuous basis. Uh, you have to read and follow the label on that, but something like chlorothionyl, uh, would work, copper-based fungicide would work as well, but yeah, that's going to be a lot of work, a lot of mm -hmm. effort. Uh, so, yeah, good sanitation, resistant varieties, it should work. Okay. And it just looks bad cosmetically. Cause, it does. You know, it just looks bad. But it, that should help. So uh, thank you, Jason, for that question. All right. Mm -hmm. Here's our next viewer email. I just planted six of these hostas a few days ago, and the leaves are turning yellow on three of them. This one gets about three hours of sun a day, but the rest are in total shade. The ones I planted last year are doing fine. What do I need to do to save them? Or is it a hopeless case? And this is Roger. 
Is this a hopeless case? I don't think so. Oh, no. And you know, to, to me, it looks like sun scald. It just, it, because usually there's a margin with a dark, you know, a dark area if it's a disease or something, but that, right. these, this is just, it looks like the sun scald to me. I don't know. Right. And, and, and since it's getting more sun than the others, I say, move it to where they are. And, and, and you know, if, they're, if the others <laughs> yeah. are happy, and it's not happy there, maybe move it to where the others are, are doing well. Uh, yes, yeah, because the others seem to be happy in the shade. Yes. Right, so I, I think I would put those in the shade. Mm -hmm. um, and Yeah, and that should work. That should, you know? I would that, think so. That should work, because you're right, if it has the real dark legions or whatever, most of the time it's nematodes or, mm -hmm. you know, something else, but you could see that. But that to me, yeah, just, just, like, it's just faded. It's just, yeah. yeah, just faded. It's just faded out from like, the, like the, exactly how sun scald looks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not a hopeless case. No. Roger. Yeah, we would just move those. Yeah, you know, move to it. the others and it'd be just fine. Uh-huh. All right. Thank you, Joanna. That was fun. You're, yeah, you're right. welcome. Right. Thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you want to learn more about anything we talked about today, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. We've got links to extension publications on all these topics and many more. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.